effects of drugs that all drugs do is make you feel temporarily different physically and psychologically. They may alter your perceptual mechanisms, they may, may alter your body sensations, they may alter your level of alertness or wakefulness, uh, they may give you feelings of butterflies in your stomach, but that's all they do. The experiences that you have on drugs are the product of our minds, that you take the raw material of that physical pharmacological effect and turn it into whatever you want. And you can turn it into polar opposites. You can turn the same drug into a terrifying experience of being poisoned, into a divine experience of spiritual revelation, uh, into a feeling of overwhelming bliss and love for other people, into paranoia, into depression, into anything. Uh, I could give you example after example of the, the ways that the mind can shape pharmacology. Uh, I, I don't have time to do that. There is wonderful uh, Jonathan Ott, who is here, uh, and I once uh, were interested in cases of people who ate uh, a mushroom in Washington, the panther amanita, that maybe he can say a word about, since this contains chemicals he's very interested in. And the difference between people who ate that mushroom accidentally and who experienced it as mushroom poisoning and thought they were about to die, and on the other hand, people who ate it deliberately looking for a psychedelic effect and found that in it is very striking. Uh, complete shaping of pharmacology, and I think all drugs work that way. You know, the drugs don't contain experiences. Uh, we shape pharmacological effects into the experiences that we are looking for, and that is not necessarily a conscious process. It has to do with unconscious expectation, it has to do with cultural definition of a drug. That again makes it very difficult, it, it again points up the folly of talking about good and bad drugs because the effects of drugs are totally variable. They vary from culture to culture, they vary from age of history to age of history. Marijuana as it's used today in the United States is not what marijuana was a hundred years ago when it was used medically in the form of a tincture. Uh, and if you read the reports of uses of marijuana in medicine in the 19th century, people didn't report getting high on it. There's very little of that in the literature. If, if they did, they probably, first of all, they may not have noticed it because they weren't led to expect that. Or if they did notice something happening, they might have considered it no more important than the experience that many people get on medical drugs of feeling drowsy or dizzy or altered in some way, that you just consider that a side effect of medication and don't think it's anything to write home about. That's very different. And it's also very different from marijuana as it was used in ancient India as a religious sacrament in certain circles. That has a very different cultural definition of what to look for in that drug. So the, the, the effects of drugs can be completely shaped by cultural expect expectation, by individual expectation, by setting as well. As just an example of the, the uh, powerful effects of setting on pharmacology, a, a colleague of mine, Dr. Norman Zinberg, who's a psychoanalyst at Harvard Medical School, uh, was some years ago uh, commissioned by the U.S. Army, this was during the Vietnam War, to study heroin use among troops in Vietnam, which was a major problem. Heroin was very cheap, it was very available, very strong, and a very high percentage of American men in Vietnam began using heroin, usually smoking it. Uh, pharmacologists would have predicted, based on what they know of just of the pharmacology of heroin, that that kind of usage would have resulted in pharmacological addiction. And that those people, when they came back to the United States, would be heroin addicts. And that the ranks of heroin addicts in the United States would have swelled enormously. Well, Zinberg, who is a great, uh, who, like me, is a very uh, great believer in the effects of set and setting, felt from interviewing lots of heroin users in Vietnam that the main reason that people got into heroin smoking over there, apart from its availability, was as a way of dealing with boredom of army life in Vietnam. Because for many people over there, the, the dominant theme of army life in Vietnam was boredom. And one of the effects of heroin is to make time pass more quickly in a boring situation. And he felt that, that from his understanding of the importance of setting and shaping pharmacology, that in fact, when most of these men came home, that they wouldn't have any problem with heroin because the conditions that caused that usage would have disappeared. And he was right. And that was being completely borne out by follow-up studies of army people who came back to the United States and just left off using heroin. There was no motivation to use it again. They didn't have go through withdrawal. They didn't become dependent on heroin. They didn't, the ranks of domestic heroin addicts didn't go up. It's a completely different prediction from what classical pharmacology would have predicted. Well, as I said, I could give you example after example of this, but I don't have time. The, the third lesson that I have learned, and this has just become much clearer to me in recent years, is the importance of what pharmacologists call pharmacokinetics. That is the, the way in which a drug is introduced and distributed through the body and to the target organs and tissues that it affects. In 
in classical pharmacology, there is a principle that is very well known and taught, and yet I think few people pay attention to the significance of it, and that is that the effect of a drug is more dependent on the rate of increase of its concentration in the bloodstream than on the absolute dose. So that a very large dose of a drug given slowly has a much milder effect than a much smaller dose of a drug given suddenly. Now that's a very well understood principle in pharmacology, but it has ramifications that I think people have not followed through. The manner of introducing a drug into the body is crucially determinant of the effects that people experience, and especially of its adverse effects, both short-term and long-term. The toxicity of drugs, their abuse potential, their addictiveness goes up exponentially as you find ways of introducing them into the, into the blood and brain more directly. Now, I used to think that the most direct way of introducing a drug into the body was by intravenous injection. It's not. Smoking is. And if you think about it, it's very clear why that is. When you inject a drug into a vein in the arm, it's diluted in a relatively large concentration of venous blood. It first goes to the heart, then to the lungs, then back to the heart, and then up to the brain. When you smoke a drug, it goes into a small volume of arterial blood, it goes in one pass to the, from the lungs to the heart and up to the brain. So the concentrations that are delivered to the brain centers responsive to it are much higher, and the acceleration, the rate of change of concentration, which is the crucial factor, is greater. You can look at drugs, the same drug, I think the easiest one to see this with is cocaine, on a spectrum of usages ranging from Indians who chew coca leaves to people who smoke the freebase form of cocaine. And you see day and night differences. There is no relationship between what happens to people who smoke cocaine base and to what happens to people who suck on coca leaves. They look like totally different drugs. <laughs> and that has to do with, principally, with the, the pharmacokinetics, with the manner of introducing a drug into the system. When just to summarize this very briefly, the reason that natural drugs, that plant drugs, are so much easier to integrate into a culture and to individual life is that they're naturally dilute preparations. And that the mechanics of them force you to generally to put them into your body through the mouth and stomach, which is the safest way to introduce a drug. Not only does that uh, allow the body time to process it, it diffuses slowly into the system. Usually the drugs are bound up in plant tissue. They diffuse out slowly. That is very determinant of what happens to people when they take drugs. Uh, just one, one reason for that, and that's a clear one, and I think many users of drugs don't understand, is that when you take a drug into your digestive system, there is a large circulation called the portal circulation, in which blood comes from the intestines to the liver, and its liver is the main processor of chemicals coming into the body, and it then enters the general circulation. When you take a drug by injection or by smoking or by snorting, you bypass that circulation. So you are introducing drugs in an unprocessed form directly into the bloodstream. That greatly increases their toxicity, their tendency to cause adverse reactions, their tendency to cause addiction and dependence over time. Again, it doesn't matter what the drug is. You can, you can form abusive relationships with any of these things, and, and taking a drug by mouth doesn't guarantee that you won't but it gives you a better chance of staying in a stable relationship with a substance over time. One of the characteristics about traditional cultures who use um, uh, preparations of plants for socially acceptable purposes is that they tend not to refine the plants as we do. They use them in crude form. Uh, and they generally put them into their body through their mouth and stomach. I mean, and, and some, obviously there are some very simple reasons for that. You can't snort a coca leaf. You can't shoot opium into your vein. Uh, that is a natural safeguard about crude botanical preparations of drugs. I think it's unfortunate that in this culture, we have fallen so much into the habit of relying on refined, purified derivatives of plants in highly concentrated form, both for recreational drugs and for medicine, and have fallen into the habit of thinking that this is somehow more scientific and more effective, that botanical drugs are old-fashioned, unscientific, messy. Uh, in fact, they're much safer. Sometimes the quality of the effects are better. That's not to say we should do away with purified drugs. They have their place. Sometimes you want very rapid, immediate, intense effects. Uh, and it's nice to have those in your back pocket, but it, there ought to be a balance between the two. And we have lost that in medicine today. Uh, most doctors wouldn't know what to do with a coca leaf if you gave it to them. Or they wouldn't know what to do with an aloe plant if you gave it to them. Uh, they wouldn't know what to do with digitalis leaves if you gave it to them as a treatment for heart failure. We, there should be a balance between these two. Well, as I say, these are the, 
Uh, these are the, the three most...